Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Barr. I'm the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's my great uh, honor to be here this evening. It's wonderful to see uh, so many alumni and Ford School friends here tonight. Um, this is my second time at this particular event, uh, and um, it's already become something that I look forward to. A great chance to connect with old friends um, here in Washington, D.C. Um, to our students um, in, the, in the crowd tonight, it's great to see you too. Um, and uh, so glad you made the trip, and I hope you're having a really productive uh, time in D.C. Uh, with the help of many alumni in the room, um, Jennifer Niggemeyer, Elizabeth Johnson, Peter Vasher, and their colleagues have put together two fantastic days of career events uh, for nearly 40 Ford School master's students on this annual DC trip. And I just want to say um, thanks to Jennifer and her team, and my thanks to all of our panelists, who you're going to hear more about uh, in just a moment. Um, I'm also um, uh, delighted to see here, but not yet on stage, um, uh, Liz uh, Gerber, the Associate Dean for Research and Policy Engagement. And I'm going to say more about Liz Gerber and her incredible impact on the Ford School uh, in just a little bit. Uh, in addition to Jennifer's team, you'll see a number of other Ford School staff here tonight, uh, including two new faces, uh, Cindy Bank, a longtime member of uh, Michigan's DC office, has come to the Ford School to be the Associate Director for the Program and Practical uh, Policy Engagement. Uh, she's right there uh, in the back. The, the bright lights are shining right, um, right here on my eyeballs. Um, Catherine Carver uh, is somewhere here this evening, um, standing by the door, um, is our new events and outreach uh, manager. And I can also say she is a great um, soccer coach of young children. Um, and uh, uh, the um, team is really um, uh, wonderful. I think uh, most of the other members of the team you've had a chance to meet before. They're here, um, the staff are here to connect with alumni and find ways to recognize and celebrate your good work. And you'll recognize them by their little um, badges on their um, uh, coats. In a few minutes, Liz is going to introduce our fantastic lineup of guest speakers and set the stage for our event on engaged learning. But first, I want to give you some updates on what's happening back at the Ford School. Um, I'd call this a state of the school uh, kind of talk, uh, but somehow without Speaker Pelosi behind me um, <laughs> clapping, um, it wasn't uh, quite right. Let me um, start with a wrap up of our recently concluded uh, Victors for Michigan uh, campaign. That's our fundraising campaign. Our goal for the Ford School was to raise $23 million, and I'm proud and thrilled to tell you that we far surpassed that goal. Uh, together, we've raised over $47 million for that campaign. Uh, I'm Thank you. Uh, and I'll uh, give a particular shout out at this point to uh, Sue Johnson and Tony Wagner um, from the development team uh, who really made this happen. Uh, and uh, to all of you, of course, um, in the um, uh, alumni and friend community of the Ford School uh, who were able to donate um, such um, fantastic um, gifts to the school. It made a huge difference. I also want to thank uh, my predecessor, um, Susan Collins, um, for her leadership uh, and energy um, on this um, uh, wonderful campaign. Let me mention a few gifts uh, in particular, gifts that will support our students, uh, research, faculty, and engagement for decades to come. Thanks to a phenomenal gift from Ron and Eileen Weiser, our newly launched Weiser Diplomacy Center will make the Ford School the premier place in the Midwest to study foreign affairs and one of the top centers nationally. Director John Chachari and his colleagues will recruit new professors of practice in international diplomacy. The host policy simulations and establish a generous and strategic package of new student fellowships, internships, international trips, and more. It's a truly transformational opportunity for the Ford School. Thanks to the tremendous support from Phil and Kathy Power and the Power Foundation, our new program and practical policy engagement will make us a national leader in building constructive partnerships between policy leaders and academia and creating value for the people of Michigan and the nation. Liz Gerber is the founding faculty director of the center, which we're calling P3E, because the full name is a little bit much. 
Uh, and her vision um, about the importance of engaged learning and policy research is essential to our future. Another gift I'd like to mention is one made by Hal and Carol Cohn, who have established a new chair for social justice at the Ford School in honor of Hal's grandparents who were killed in the Holocaust. And our longtime Ford School committee chair, Jim Hudak, has established a new chair in health policy. These um, campaign gifts, I know some of them are deeply personal. Some members of the MPP class of 2008 are here tonight. When their friend and classmate Maggie Weston passed away in 2014, tragically at the age of 32, her parents endowed a fund in her honor. The fund provides a lasting tribute to Maggie, providing fellowship and internship support to young people who are deeply committed to the same kinds of educational equity issues that Maggie championed so well and so passionately in her lifetime. Thanks to the good friend of the Ford School, Hank Meyer, and other uh, admirers of President Ford, we established the prestigious Gerald R. Ford Presidential Fellowship. And we have so many other um, gifts. Uh, I won't list them all tonight, but gifts from the Trehan Family Fund to establish new internships, and gifts from Je uh, Shelley and Joel Tauber um, to establish new ways of uh, engaging in collective action um, for our students. You'll notice a theme among these fellowships and new initiatives. Each of them includes a significant component of applied learning, engaged learning. That's an integral element of our vision for the future, as Liz will describe. And these are just some of the many ways our alumni and friends are supporting the Ford School, helping us to grow and thrive and make a bigger impact in the world. I'll briefly mention a few other highlights from a very busy year at the Ford School. We launched major new initiatives this year on leadership and something we're calling Conversations Across Difference, helping to bridge the deep divides in our country today. We've, st uh, we've, we've launched uh, and, and will launch uh, officially, um, uh, starting with the first class next year, a one-year Master of Public Affairs program for mid-career professionals. We've started offering concentrations for our MPP students in key areas from social policy to international development. And we remain a destination for some of the country's most prominent policymakers who come to lecture and teach. Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence, Javed Ali, I know was gonna be here, but I haven't seen him yet. He's not lurking in the audience. Okay, uh, Javed is um, uh, taught national security um, last uh, year and is coming back again uh, in the winter. We have three uh, Towsley Foundation policymakers in residence right now with us. Uh, public health expert Phyllis Meadows, FinTech expert Adrian Harris, and the Honorable Sandy Levin, who joins our faculty after decades of outstanding public service in the United States Congress. And there's been more great news on the hiring front. Over the last year, we've added terrific strength. Uh, Brendan Nyan, who studies fake news. Robert Hampshire, who works on smart cities. Eduardo Montero and Yusuf Negers, who study international development. And most recently, uh, I don't think we've even actually formally announced this, Charlotte Cavalle, who's a comparative political scientist focused on social policy, who'll be joining us um, from Georgetown. I open tonight by recognizing alumni for their financial contributions, and of course that's uh, important. For our school, however, it's also just as important for our alumni to give back in other ways. And we're really proud of how, how active our alumni really are. You help us recruit students, for example. Fully 68 alumni made calls to admitted students last spring, making a personal connection and encouraging them to choose the Ford School. And I'm told 88 alums have signed up for recruitment this coming year. So thank you very much, and let me um, clap to, to thank those of you here who are doing it. You also, very importantly, and I'll say in front of our students, you hire our students uh, for jobs and for internships. You serve on our alumni board. You share advice and connections both by email and during visits back to Ann Arbor, and we're deeply grateful uh, for that. We need your help and we welcome your engagement. I wanted to um, wrap up my opening remarks tonight with a word of encouragement. Um, I know Joe Davidson was planning to be here, but I'm not sure he's here yet. Is Joe here? Nope. Um, Joe uh, is a master's alum and a journalist who covers federal workforce issues for the Washington Post. And he's had a lot to write about, as you can imagine, in the last few weeks uh, and years. 
I was especially struck by his column from last week describing the emotional and psychological toll of the government shutdown, the disruption in trust and the stress that results from having one's professional mission threatened. Regardless of whether you were furloughed, if you work in DC or aspire to a career in public service, you're affected by the current political climate, by the divisive and corrosive rhetoric around public institutions and public policy in general. The fact is your work is important. People believe in your mission. They believe in public service, and they believe in the analytical communication and leadership skills we're giving to the folks who will be leading our communities for the next 50 years to come. And so please keep up the good work. We're grateful for you. We're rooting for you. We're proud of you. Go blue. And now for the main event. Um, tonight, we're fortunate to be joined by one of Michigan's most distinguished faculty members, our own Elizabeth Gerber. She is the Jack L. Walker Collegiate Professor of Public Policy, Professor of Political Science, and Research Asso Associate at the Center for Political Studies, as well as the Associate Dean uh, for Research and Engagement. Liz directs our program in practical policy engagement, P3E, and serves as our Associate Dean, as I said, uh, for research and policy engagement. She's a true partner with me, along with Associate Dean Paula Lance in leading the Ford School, and I really couldn't imagine our future without her. Liz earned her doctorate at Michigan and then spent 10 years on the political science faculty at UC San Diego. We were fortunate to recruit her back to Michigan in 2001. Her influential research addresses the critical and challenging issues of regional governance, intergenerational cooperation, and policy to enhance transportation and economic development. Uh, for that work, among other things, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I've just learned um, will be a DOJ uh, award recipient tomorrow. Um, this is one of the cool things you get to learn as your dean. Every time I um, see Liz in my office, I learn some extra cool thing that she is doing that I didn't know anything about, and I can't plausibly know how she does all that uh, and so much more. She's an exemplary teacher and mentor with a deeply creative and innovative approach to education. She helped reinvent our applied policy seminar, a course which enables our master's students to engage with a supervised uh, consulting project with real world clients. The APS is now the highlight of many master's students' experiences at the Ford School and a core part of our new P3 initiative as well. And she's at the cutting edge using collaborative simulation software and exploring new approaches to online and hybrid learning. So with that, please join me in thanking and in welcoming Liz Gerber. Uh, touching and, um, you know, exaggerated, but very nice uh, uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I was standing over there listening and looking at all of these 40s of different generation uh, level in what you're doing in your careers, but uh, it may, I honestly, like, got a little weepy for a second because <laughs> I love the Ford School and the reason is you and teaching you and working with you and mentoring all of you um, has been a, really a highlight of my, not just my career, but my life, I would say. So thank you for that um, and how wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, so as Michael said, um, the purpose of this panel is to uh, talk a little bit about how the Ford School is thinking right now about policy engagement in general and engaged learning as a core part of what we do as a school and both how current and future alumni can be involved. So how many of you are current alumni? See how I did that? So you're alumni. And how many of you are future alumni? <laughs> okay, excellent, thanks. So there's gonna, I'm not gonna ask you for money, but I am gonna ask you 
to do the kind of work that my friends up here do, which is help us with some of our engaged learning work that is so critical to, the, to what we do um, at the Ford School. So let me just be clear, when I'm, when I'm talking about engaged learning here, there are a lot of ways to think about engagement, policy engagement and engaged learning. But the way that I like to think about it and, and many of us at the Ford School are trying to focus on is um, direct, explicit, and mutually beneficial partnerships with people and organizations outside of the university who play a direct role in the education process. So that's either through things like the Applied Policy Seminar, where we have student teams working with real world clients on real problems, not just term papers, but real challenges that the organizations are facing. Um, and so, and then lots of other variants on that, whether that's internships, whether that's short-term research assistantships, whether that's helping us with policy simulations and that sort of thing. But it's all about the practical art of getting stuff done. The Phil Power, who's one of the uh, generous donors that is supporting a lot of the engaged learning work that we're doing at the Ford School, he's kind of a funny guy. He's got a real personality, a big personality. But he actually likes to say, we're going to get stuff done. And that's what we're learning how to do. And so, because um, I can't teach you guys that. You've got to teach yourself. I can create situations, I can create opportunities, but you've got to do that learning with help. And so what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight is um, I've got two of our champion, our A+, plus, our superstar applied policy seminar clients, Dave Lehrer and Eric Beinhart from GAO and the Justice Department respectively, talking a little bit about what they have experienced as clients with us and other universities as well in the engaged learning process. <clears throat> and then, I don't know how many, excuse me, <clears throat> um, many of you probably know some of our distinguished alumni who are also up here, um, who in their day at the Ford School were students in the Applied Policy Seminar. And so we're gonna ask them to each talk a little bit about the experience that they had doing engaged learning, that is working with a real client during their academic time at the Ford School and how that's affected what they do now. <clears throat> I will tell you from my perspective as a teacher, it's the most um, rewarding kind of teaching that I can do because I, well one, I don't have to stand up and lecture, which I don't really enjoy doing so much and nobody really likes that, do they? Does anybody like lecturing? Probably not. Um, I don't, um, but what I do love is to be able to help students think through problem solving and problem solving on lots of different dimensions, both vis-a-vis -vis the client, the, like the hard problem, but also all the soft problem solving, like how do I work with my teammates? How do I communicate this thing effectively? How do I manage the expectations of the client that seem a bit out of, um, out of sync with what we thought we were going to be doing and so on. So from my perspective, I get to watch that learning taking place. But what I'm going to do now is turn it over and ask our colleagues to talk to you about how that learning took place with them. And then at the end, I'm going to come back and make a plea to all of you about how you can help us do more of the engaged learning work that we're doing at the Ford School. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dave Lehrer, from the GAO. And then um, if you guys, I, I'm not going to stand up here and go down the row. So as each one of you finishes, if you just introduce yourselves, and then um, I'll come back up when you're done. Dave. Great. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Dave Lehrer. Thank you for having me. I'm an assistant director of the Education Workforce and Income Security uh, Group at GAO. Um, for those, you should all know what GAO is and, and what we do, but in case you don't, um, GAO is the investigative arm of the United States Congress. We do public policy research on behalf of Congress uh, that is sourced either through a direct request from a congressional committee of jurisdiction, a mandate in law, or uh, we also do some work under what's called the Controller General's Authority. Uh, the Controller General of the United States is, is my boss. Uh, Chris is as well, and there's some other GAO people in the audience. Um, with respect to the engaged learning, I, well, I should say my primary area of work is uh, um, retirement security, uh, uh, financial security for an aging population. 
I've been doing that work since about 2004, and not coincidentally, I've been the liaison for recruiting for the University of Michigan uh, uh, at GAO since uh, 2004 as well. And not quite as long with the APS program, but for a, a lot of years now. And um, with respect to the program, we see it as a partnership. We get it just as much out of the experience as you all do going through the program. Uh, we start with a real world example. This is not some kind of scenario. This is a request that we expect to be doing. We've already received from the Congress, something we think that we have in the pipeline that's gonna be a request very soon. Um, and so these are things that will feed, the work that you do in the Applied Policy Seminar GAO will feed into actual GAO published work. Another thing that's very important is, is that the experience be real. And so we want you all to have the experience where you understand what it's like to do public policy research at GAO. So we're going to run you through a design and scoping exercise where you will scope the work, you will look at the data sources, you will reach out to experts in the area, you will read literature and academic research on the topic, you will be providing us with your experience, your summary of that information. Then once we have agreed on that uh, methodology, the way that the work will be applied, then you'll go out and you'll do actually that work. You'll collect the data and you'll analyze the data. You'll look at the data reliability aspects of it. You'll go out and talk to people who have real world experience about the issues that you're researching. Um, it may be individuals at the university. I know they contribute a lot as well. Um, it might be people at the state level. It might be at the federal level. It could be um, folks who work in industry, depending on the subject matter. So you're going out and getting that academic, uh, sorry, anecdotal information and collecting that as well. Then once you've gone through, done your analysis, you've done your due diligence with respect to the data and the information that you've collected, you'll begin to develop your message. We'll bring you back online and we'll work with you to develop that message using the tools and techniques that we apply at GAO on all of our work. So we will ask you to develop a message agreement uh, uh, document which talks about all of the things that you've learned, but more importantly, what that means. How are you gonna talk about the final results of your work in, in your final product? We'll work with you to develop a final product, whether that is a presentation that you'll do, which is probably the most common uh, with GAO, either vir uh, virtually uh, via uh, video conferencing or uh, more recently, a lot of the students have been traveling to Chicago and have been doing the presentation from there. Uh, some of the teams also, in addition to the presentation, will also do a written report, uh, and we're happy to, to work with you on, on that as well. Um, from the standpoint of uh, um, how we would like it to go, uh, obviously we want it to be real world, but we also want it to be a mentoring experience. So we want to work with you through the challenges that you're facing. We, and to do that, we schedule regular meetings. I know there are several people in the audience that have worked on these projects. Often they're bi-weekly meetings where we'll check in uh, um, you know, via, via Skype or WebEx and, and see how things are going. Talk about you know, uh, the information that you're learning. Do you have any questions about the approach that you're applying? Um, but that being said, it, it is a real world experience, but we want the experience to be the goal of the relationship. We don't want the end product to be what's driving it. Because what we want at the end of the day is for you to have the experience of what it's like to do real world public policy analysis that's going to make a difference. And, and to get the experience that you would have, uh, uh, frankly, if you came to GAO. Um, in, in terms of the, quickly, the, the subject matter, just I'll pick four most recent projects because I don't want to leave anyone out. So these are just the most recent. I'm looking at spa, uh, state-sponsored retirement <coughs> programs, retirement plan uh, um, advice that's given through automatic, uh, uh, we call them robo-advisors, uh, municipal scholarship programs, and uh, options to extend uh, labor force participation of older workers. So um, I encourage you to take advantage of this uh, class, this experience. Um, uh, again, we get probably more out of it than you all do, but we just, we absolutely love doing it. And uh, I, I believe there's gonna be a question and answer session uh, as a part of this. So I'll, I'll end there and be happy to enter any of your questions then. Thanks. My name's Eric Beinhart and I work for the <clears throat> International Criminal Investigative Training Assistance Program also known as ISITAP. Uh, we're part of the criminal division of the Justice Department, but we have an unenviable business model in that DOJ pays for four of our staff positions and everything else comes from basically the State Department, from the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Bureau, INL, 
and the Counterterrorism Bureau. So suffice it to say, we need to rely on a lot of inexpensive uh, talent to do what we do. Um, and so I'm a huge advocate of capstones. Um, our mission at ISETAP is really to develop the capacity of, law, of developing countries, uh, law enforcement, corrections, and forensics uh, operations deal to deal with transnational crime and terrorism and do it in a way that respects human rights and human dignity. Uh, the way we do this is by promoting sustainable institutional development. So let me go back quickly. In 1986, when ISITOP was created, our name made sense because all we were doing was providing criminal investigation training in Central American countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. That was it, just training. That all changed in 1990, after the overthrow of Manuel Noriega in Panama. So ISITAP went in after the US Army when things had settled down, and we worked with the Panamanian government to develop a new police force from scratch. So that requires a lot more than simply training. It requires um, a lot of uh, mentoring, uh, technical assistance, developing policies, procedures um, that build a framework of, of an institution that you can build upon. Training is obviously a part of that, uh, but it's only one part. So that really began ISITAP's uh, dedication to promoting sustainable institutional development. There's a reason why I don't say achieve sustainable institutional development because that's very hard to do. And there are a lot of outside factors that determine whether that happens. A lot of them have to do with host country will um, and political dynamics in the country. But anyway, uh, so for years, we were promoting this sustainable institutional development. Everyone promotes sustainable institutional development. INL, USAID, DFID, everyone does it. But what does it mean? What does it mean? We wanted to provide concrete examples of what ISITAP means when we say that we do, that we promote sustainable institutional development. So we started by writing a, a basic concept paper. And if you have the, um, the diagram, the colorful diagram there on the right, um, that was basically what this uh, concept paper was about 12 pages long, laid out. <clears throat> it was a good start, but we realized we needed much more. So the question became, how are we going to do that with very limited resources? The answer was through capstone. So we, we partnered with Liz on one capstone and with the Maxwell School at Syracuse on two capstones. And the paper is divided into three parts. So the first part is the um, really fleshing out the, this diagram um, and the four, the four analyses that you see in the yellow section um, in the middle there. The second part is um, looking at seven ISITAP programs that have successfully promoted sustainable institutional development. That's where Liz's capstone class was, uh, played an integral part. They did a lot of research, uh, a lot of primary research. All of our capstones require a tremendous amount of primary research, reaching out to ISITAP uh, program managers in the field, uh, academia, experts, uh, we strongly believe that primary research is essential to good capstone projects. The third and final section was the monitoring and evaluation section. Um, we have not done a good job the last 33 years in monitoring and evaluating our, pro our programs. Uh, fortunately, no one else has either. So um, we decided that this was a good opportunity to uh, make a, a bold step. And um, so 
the, the, the work of the three capstones w was phenomenal. Um, this is the final product, which was published in 2018 by the Justice Department. And I, I, I hope I don't, I don't like to exaggerate, but I, I would, if somebody asked me to estimate how much the capstones were worth, I, I would, uh, um, I would say that I think the three capstones, we could not have gotten a better value if we had paid a consultant $150,000 to do this work. And I've worked with a lot of consultants on a lot of different things. So um, um, we've done 26 capstones in the last six years with eight different universities. Um, we rely on capstones for developing curricula for ACTAP programs around the world, for strategic planning purposes, uh, for all sorts of research, so we are big believers in capstones, and uh, one of our distinguished capstone alumni, alumni here, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I just want to thank uh, Michigan and Liz particularly for being great partners in this endeavor. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Manning. I'm class of 2015. So my fellow, yeah, I wasn't sure it was wooing. Um, <laughs> so I came to this project in the student side. So I worked with the city of Lansing to develop a regional recycling model. So the idea was the fourth largest city in Michigan didn't have municipal recycling. And how can we help solve that? Perhaps by pooling resources of localities around, the township, the county, some of the suburbs. Perhaps you could have one facility that the recycling resources could go to. And I thought, being from Michigan, that uh, we had a 10 cent deposit. This is easy, right? You know, we know recycling, like it's in our blood. Not really. So it turns out Michigan has a terrible recycling rate. You look at the, the city of Detroit. I, at least I can use 2015. They did not have municipal recycling in the largest city in Michigan. I don't know what's happened in four years, but I don't think they have it still. Uh, you're spoiled in a city like DC. We just have a giant blue bin. You dump everything in. So uh, we went into this. Um, we sort of assembled our crack APS team working with the city of Lansing. You know, we had the, the Stata guy. We had the Excel guy. I guess I was the guy with the car. So that was, <laughs> that was sort of like my really important role was the guy with the car. Were there any gals? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, there, okay. there was, was. Yeah. As the only female. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but so every week we made our, our commute up to, to Lansing and then we went to some of the, the townships and really the communities around because there's a lot going on in Michigan has some interesting laws when it comes to what's a township, what's a county, what's a city, things I really hadn't thought about very much. I just thought, oh, the city of Lansing, I didn't understand that there's a very wealthy township that's right next to it that has certain stakes. So working with a really diverse group of stakeholders, we got a lot of insight um, and everybody's sort of a different, you know, stake in this. And it was really valuable being a student, being able to see, okay, here's what the city of Lansing thinks as the big, the giant in the room. Here's what the wealthy township thinks as someone who has the resources. Here's what uh, the county thinks as the largest landholder in the area. And sort of putting all these pieces together with our team. Um, so we tried to put together a kind of a model, this idea that if you had a municipal recycling facility that was used sort of as a shared resource by all these stakeholders that you might be able to have something there. <laughs> and so I remember uh, we were driving down for our final presentation, so we spent you know, uh, 10, 12 weeks meeting with our clients kind of throughout the area, and the day we're driving down, I remember it was also the Ford School cookie day. I don't know if you guys still do that, but we had this thing where it was like, you know, I remember just like piling cookies. I was like, well, I'm not, you know, I gotta leave for the day. I'm gonna like get like a whole napkin's worth. So I'm like driving, I get like, cookie like all over myself, it's like it's frosting, it's kind of like gross and I get that, I don't really realize it until I'm like walking to the Lansing mayor's office, I'm like, oh, I have like frosting all over my face, like, you know, and like I'm like nervous, like this is the worst case scenario and we walk in, uh, it's like a group of, I think there's six of us and we do our presentation and the whole time I'm just thinking like this was terrible, you know, we, we didn't do a good job, like, you know, we produced this deliverable, we were up all night working on it, and then I looked around the room and realized that half of what we had accomplished was bringing those people together. It was bringing the city of Lansing with Meridian Township, with uh, Ingham County, and that sometimes you have these 
sort of externalities that come out of these. And so, yes, we produced a 30-page paper that was read by, you know, someone, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but I think the greater value we had was getting all these people together and get them talking. Because so often that's lost. And this is something I carried to my own professional world. So I, I work uh, with the Department of Energy doing appropriations work. And a lot of what it is, just getting the right people in the room to talk about this stuff. Um, and I think that APS really helped me learn about that. And uh, I'm really happy that this program exists. And I, you know, big supporter of it. Um, so happy to talk more about that. But um, sometimes like, just getting the right people in the room can accomplish a lot. Hi everyone, good evening, my name is Ryan Peterson. Uh, I currently work with Booz Allen Hamilton. I'm an IT project manager and agile coach over there. Um, but maybe I'll start with my APS and how I got to that point. So I remember you know, a lot of classwork and we get all the background in economics and how we can do all these improvements and the theory behind everything and then really excited to take the APS course because now we can start applying it, right? Um, and I went into grad school wanting to do government consulting, so landed in the right spot for me, but this is like a real world example where I can start, you know, getting my, getting my feet in the water a little bit. And so um, I think one of the things that surprised me about it, though, was not that I could come in. So my project was with a county veterans affairs office, and so we come in and they're trying to do better outreach and uh, to reach out to more of their veterans in the, in the county. And uh, so there's some clear ways that we could come in and help and get some more targeted approaches and some better ways to have some communication strategies. Uh, but that wasn't, I thought that would be the big part. Turns out that was the smaller aspect of, of the, the work that we did. A lot more of it was dealing with the people and how you interact and how you communicate that to a client. And so that really became apparent that this project wasn't about just advising on a policy that you could do, but actually how you have to work with people and bring people together to implement that policy was really important and something I learned. Um, not only that, but understanding the culture of an organization and how they interact with each other. So uh, that was really helpful, and I was actually able to parlay that into my next job, which was working for um, a smaller uh, firm called Empower Strategies, but they were, their client was the Veterans Affairs. So I got that job because in the interview, they asked me about the Veterans Affairs culture and understanding that culture and being able to say, oh, Brian can jump in and really understand because there is a, a learning curve to not just being able to advise people properly, but how you advise people and how you communicate that properly is, is very important. Um, one of the other aspects I learned from the APS project was that uh, we had to kind of self-manage our team and as a project manager, I still use some of those skills to this day. Uh, so for my team, I remember we had the behavioral test that we did. I can't remember. We still do that. It's the strengths finder. Yeah. And so uh, you know, a lot of teams in your group projects, you go, all right, we'll just divvy up everything equally. And our team said, no, we're not going to do that. We said, what do you like to do? What's your strengths? You do that. Doesn't matter if that's sixty percent or eighty percent. We all said that's that's how we we're going to divvy it up. And actually, everyone was happier that way too. And so that's something I actually bring to my team is is where are your strengths? What are strengths do you want to pursue and help? And so that's utilized today. Um, so I'm still still applying that even in my current uh, career. Um, so I, I was I was in the Veterans Affairs after that. So I guess more about me after that. So I worked with Veterans Affairs, uh, Veterans Benefits Management System. So when uh, veterans started to go outside of the VA network, so I worked on the IT infrastructure for that. Um, after that, I moved on to the IRS. So that's been interesting now with the budget. Um, budget. Uh, stuff that's going on, so we've been a little bit affected by that, uh, but we're struggling through. But I um, started on private debt collection, so that was an infrastructure bill to finance roads, bridges, through getting more debt um, brought into the IRS. Uh, also did country by country, so that's if you have billion dollar organizations that have international um, locations, there's actually not communication between those countries, and so to bridge that tax gap, we're starting a communication channel, so setting up the IT infrastructure to have that communication. Uh, my, I also worked on um, data strategy, and I'm currently on web applications. So I suggest all of you to go to irs.gov backslash account. You can actually log in. You can see <laughs> if you owe the IRS any money. It's right there. We also have identity, um, identity theft verification, so if it's been stolen or anything like that. So, uh, But it's a great, great project, um, and this little website and team that were pretty spartan uh, is generating billions of dollars, so it's really cool um, work to be part of. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Chris Falcone. I'm a graduate in the class of 2014. Um, and I enjoyed a applied policy seminar so much that I did it twice. Um, so first, I worked with an economic development coordinator for the city of Adrian, Michigan. And to show you how real world our project was, it was sold to us and we signed up as doing a research project to help them understand equity crowdfunding and how it could be leveraged as a tool to help their local community raise funds from within the community to support local businesses. Week one, project shifted. The Michigan legislature was considering an equity crowdfunding bill. So instead of doing primarily research about this topic, we became advocates in trying to work with the city of Adrian and other stakeholders to get this bill shepherded through the Michigan legislature. Involved a lot of um, networking, um, relationship building skills, talking with legislatures and uh, legislators and other stakeholders throughout the state of Michigan. And I'd say the culmination of that part of the project was that our team actually had the um, privilege of testifying in front of the Michigan House Commerce Committee about some of the work that we did. Um, really a rewarding uh, experience. And the, the bill actually was enacted that year during, um, during our project, which is also very fulfilling. But we also wanted to take the project a step further, because um, you know when a bill gets passed, that's great, but what happens next? How do people know about the bill? What's the risks? How does it actually get implemented? So the second part of our project was working with local stakeholders and helping them develop implementation guides and guidance for local businesses and, and individuals who might want to invest in their own local community. And this really prepared me um, for the real world in taking a real world issue, getting flipped on its head right from week one, seeing an issue from multiple sides and then strategizing within a very limited period of time of how, how to implement this into an actual solution for the local community. And my second project was actually working uh, with a GAO team, uh, with Dave actually, um, looking at retirement security and specifically um, uh, employee coverage uh, for, with employer-sponsored retirement plans. So needless to say, very different than uh, the first project. It was very data intensive, and I think Dave's description was right on, talking to a lot of stakeholders, understanding um, and researching the available data sources, working with the data sources, um, working with the GAO experts, understanding their process, taking um, a very broad subject and scoping it down into um, a researchable question, and then executing, coming up, uh, analyzing the data, coming up with our message, um, presenting our findings, and uh, producing that 20, 30 page report, which you read today, right? I did, Yeah. Mm -hmm. twice. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> um, so one way um, that that experience really shaped my professional career is that I now work at the GAO. Um, I am a senior analyst with our strategic issues team, and I focus largely on human capital management and the 2020 census. So this uh, project really uh, gave a great insight into how the GAO works. Um, now, every time I'm having new projects, I go through very exactly the same process that we did on that project. We get a fairly broad topic. We break it down into researchable questions. We think about the methods, about how we will answer that question. We do the research, take some time, uh, and then we come back, develop our message, and produce our, produce our report. So it was a very, um, it's a very rewarding experience and really showed um, what work was like at the GAO. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Claire Hutchinson. I am also in the class of 2014. Um, I'm currently on the corporate affairs team at Humana. Um, so I also fell on the same camp as Chris in that I liked my APS project so much that I did it twice. Um, and I worked with a team that worked with the Heaton Warp Fund, which is in Detroit. Um, and it's a nonprofit that pro provides utility assistance for low-income families in Michigan. They provide about $15 million annually. Um, and so when we started our project, they said to us, we have tons of data, tell us what to do with our data. And didn't give us a lot of direction. They had lots of things that they would have considered quote unquote databases or data sets that they kind of sent our way and said, help us understand our customers. Um, 
And part of the Heat and Warmth Fund was that they had a hub and spoke model. So they have one nonprofit agency that works with about 40 different community centers within the state of Michigan. And they were very focused on, tell us about the people that ultimately benefit from our grants. And they were kind of missing the fact that there was another step between them and the ultimate beneficiary, and that was their community centers. Um, so when we started kind of working on the project, we met with various um, groups that were responsible for providing grants directly to beneficiaries. And what we quickly learned was the relationship between the nonprofit organization, THAW, and their community partners was not very strong. And so when we were kind of working with our client, they were expecting us to come back and say, here's all of the different people that you serve and here's how you get them engaged. And we kind of got to the end of our project and we said, no, the message is really, you need to have better engagement with your community centers. Um, so Liz really gave us a pep talk and was like, you guys can go and provide like a message that isn't gonna be great. Nobody likes to hear you have a partner organization that's not happy with you. Um, so we went and we kind of shared this feedback and they were really receptive because it was about the message of, you know, you want to ultimately serve people better, um, but we've missed a part here. And as part of that um, and their reception to it, we said there were two of us. My co-partner is actually here, Christine Wagner, um, and we worked together and said, we're going to do another semester and we're going to help you figure out how you kind of build this relationship between your partner organizations. So as part of that, we went out and collected actual data on the partner organizations and we said, you know, this, these places provide WIC funding and these pr places help with tax assistance. And we basically were able to put together profiles of all of the different services that their partner organizations provided and then they were able to say, oh, this is the profile of the type of services that our partner provides. And if we want to have a good relationship with our partner, we need to know what our partner is actually doing in the community. So um, as part of that, we also provided a whole host of recommendations as to how they could improve engagement um, among their kind of partner agencies. And that ranged everything from, you know, doing monthly calls to having a newsletter that spotlighted various different organizations and following the issues that these types of organizations would um, be really attuned to to understand the cyclical nature of their business. Um, so I think that in working through that, really learning from the, you know, it's not fun to deliver a hard message, but it is ultimately going to be most important. And I think the theme that a lot of people set up here is we started out on one path and we ended up somewhere totally and completely different. Um, and I think that that happens to all of us in the real world. <laughs> like I think that everybody can highlight lots of different professional situations where you may take a job and think your one job is going to be in, you know, your role is going to be very specific and it's going to fit in a square box and that doesn't end up the way it works at the end of the day. Um, so I think that it was a really wonderful opportunity to kind of continue learning, working with people, getting through the points, um, you know, difficult situations and working with a wide variety of people to ultimately serve a client in a very, you know, in an effective way. So. It was it was really fun for me to relive some of the <laughs> good and challenging moments in all of those. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for that. Okay, um, I'm going to be extremely brief for you, future alumni. In other words, current students. Um, for um, are any of you for some of you are first years or are you all second years? Okay, for your first years, take the APS in the fall, um, and I can't guarantee what will happen because that's kind of the nature, as Claire said so well. But you will learn a lot, uh, and it will 
um, be, I think, a, a memorable and important part of your uh, Ford School experience. So that's for the first year students. Second year students, you're going to be um, out there in the world, so start thinking about ways that you can work with Ford School students as capstone, APS type um, uh, on projects with students over the next few years. And when you get your good ideas, bring them to me um, and Cindy, who's back here. Um, and uh, we are really excited to be able to expand the, both the opportunities for APS and the number of students uh, who are engaging in them. So that's for our future alumni. Current alumni, bring us your projects. Um, as you heard from Dave and Eric, um, you know there are huge benefits to having students spending a, a dozen weeks working from their perspective a little bit outside of the day-to-day. -day. They can take a step back, see things that you might not be able to see, add capacity, add ideas, add energy, and uh, we can create these really great experiences. So um, please contact me anytime, um, and uh, I would love to talk, even if you don't have a fully fleshed out idea, if you think you have a good idea for an APS project, I don't even wanna say what a good idea is because they can be so many different things, um, but if it's something that's important to your organization that you think some <coughs> students could productively work on and help you with, come and talk to me about them. Okay, all right, so um, we're at time, but we've got a reception. Um, where's Elizabeth? Is she in the room? Can we have a, just a few questions, yes. you think, Peter? Okay, all right, so let's take, um, if anybody has questions for the panelists that you'd like to ask now, and again, we'll, we'll be um, uh, heading out for uh, reception after, but uh, any questions? Anybody have any questions? How about how in the world did that bill become a law in less than like eight weeks? How about that? That's my question. Um, I don't know if I had much to do with that. <laughs> um, it was a good bill, just br actually. Just bringing a lot of stakeholders together and really getting people to see the value from all sides. And like, like Matt said, bringing people into the same room yeah. and talking about it. Questions? <laughs> they do not. Martha. <laughs> <laughs> Martha, do you know? We have a regional recycling program. Okay, that's good. I, I, don't, I don't think that existed four years ago. Anybody else? Yeah. Eric and Dave, can you talk a little about how you got internal buy in to begin to set up a project with these external agencies? Yeah. I didn't ask anyone, I just thought about <laughs> we, we have a very loose organization. No, no, ser seriously, I've, I've That's been... the upside of your budget model. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We have no money, but we can do anything we want. <laughs> but no, it, it's... Uh, I, I've been there a long time. I've been there when we started the, these programs. I've been there 15 years. And so I had a pretty good idea of what... Um, what our priorities were, and I talked with our director and you know our, our uh, uh, senior management, and um, they gave me a lot of latitude just to do stuff. So, you know, and then I was fortunate to meet Liz and other great faculty, and um, you know they're very creative too, and the students. It was just a synergy of uh, uh, very loose creativity. The uh, um, office that I work at at GAO, the Education, Workforce, and Income Security team, education's a big part of that. And my boss uh, has children that went to the University of Michigan. She uh, <laughs> roots for the football team that plays in Ann Arbor. And so it was, a, it was a very easy sell to her to bring these projects in. After she saw them cycle through a couple of times, then it wasn't even a question anymore. So it's, it's a system now that we have in place to be able to have this on, on a recurring basis. And uh, um, sometimes uh, um, in the, the fall and again in the, in the winter term. So it's great. I will say from, from a faculty perspective, what I've seen is the more engaged the partners are, the clients are, the 
better the experiences, both for the students, but also for the partners, right? So, um, you know, nobody has time for anything, of course, but it's time well spent with the students. Um, and so from, the, from my perspective and just observing the dynamics, um, you know, once the, once, once the organization meets the students, um, it's, it's a good thing. Like nobody thinks, oh man, these darn students, what a burden. Um, and so as Dave said, you know, both in the current moment working with the students, but then also when the conversation comes up, like should we do this again, um, it, there, there are huge benefits on both sides. So um, sometimes getting your foot in the door and just sort of making the space for it, I think is so, sort of what I'm hearing your question. But um, however you can do that in your organization, it's, 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 it's kind of like, um, you know, the second date is easier than the first date in this case, because <laughs> usually the first date goes pretty well. So, um, yeah. There's huge benefits sitting right to my left. See? <laughs> Questions? Yep. Okay. I believe it's time for a reception. So thank you all so much. Um, have a wonderful trip. Uh, those of you who are current students, um, I hope you learn a lot, make good connections. Um, and uh, for all of you alumni, uh, welcome back um, and keep in touch and go blue. Thanks. Liz and panel, let me just say, as you go out, you'll see there on the tables, there are little tents that say what topic area, if you're gathered at that table, you might find somebody who can anchor the conversation around that topic. But feel free to mingle around, talk to anyone you want to, uh, visit with the staff, with the faculty, with our alums, um, with our students, and uh, have a great time. Thank you. Good job, team.